Well, take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. For those of you visiting with us this morning, you can grab a Bible from the pew, find the book of Acts in the index, and turn to Acts chapter 10. Now, today is the day the world has chosen to celebrate the fact that the tomb of Jesus Christ, that tomb he was buried on, on good, in on Good Friday, <clears throat> is empty. Good Friday is called Good Friday because that was the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty as demanded by God for the sins of all those who would believe. So part of Friday, Jesus was in the tomb. Part of Saturday, the Sabbath, he was in the grave. And then part of Sunday, the first day of the week, he was also in the grave. And then he rose from the dead on the third day. The technical name for this day is Resurrection Sunday, the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, gathered together today in this room are two groups of people. One group might show up uh, on an Easter Sunday once a year under the category of what we might call religious obligation. We're grateful that God has brought you to this place this day to be with us. I trust you've received a warm welcome. The other group are those who fully understand the ramifications of Resurrection Sunday and actually celebrate the reality of that empty tomb every moment of every day of our lives. Simply stated, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the greatest event in history. It's not just the greatest event in history for, for followers of Christ, it's the single greatest event in the history of the world. Jesus said in Matthew 20, verse 28, that he did not come to this world to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Not for all, but for many. Jesus came to earth to die. The second person of the Godhead, Christ, came to earth to be born as a man, adding humanity onto his deity, and he came to live a perfect sinless life. He came to die to pay the price demanded by God for the sins of all who would believe. And for those who believe, and by that I, I don't mean they believe the details, I mean they've been given the ability to comprehend the truth about that empty tomb. They've given their life to live for Jesus Christ. For those who believe that Jesus died in their place, that Jesus died to conquer sin and Satan and death, they understand that had he not conquered the grave, had he not risen from the dead, they would have been destined and deserving of an eternity in hell. That's why they celebrated every moment of their life. For those who see this simply as a religious holiday, you need to know that this is something you cannot fully understand. You, you cannot fully understand the importance of Christ's resurrection. In the Bible, the word of God, the word of the living God, explains why this is. Listen to this. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, that a natural man, that means a, a, a man who is not a true follower of Jesus Christ, a person who is not a true follower of Jesus Christ, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them. He does not, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. In other words, they can only be understood by one who has been made spiritually alive by God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, for the word of the cross 
that Jesus died for sins, was buried, and rose from the dead is foolishness to those who are perishing. They're spiritually dead. They're dying. But to us, that's an opposite group, those who understand the resurrection, it's the power of God. To say it another way, a true follower, for the true follower of Jesus Christ, Easter is not a historical event. It is our very life. And it's not Easter. It's Resurrection Day. For everyone else, Easter Sunday is a holiday on the calendar. But again, we're, we're so grateful that God has brought you to this place. Now, I've, I've used the phrase true follower of Jesus Christ, a couple of times now. Let me tell you what that means. Jesus was asked the question in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, what it meant to be a a follower of his. This is what he said. If anyone wishes, if anyone wants to come after me, to follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, And follow me. Simple to understand. Jesus here gives three aspects of what a true follower of Jesus Christ looks like. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must first deny himself. And that means one must be willing to put his personal desires aside for God's desires, for God's will. God's will for the true follower of Jesus Christ is far more important than anything he would want. Secondly, he says he must take up his cross daily. The cross was a symbol of torture and death. In other words, one must be willing to die to self or even literally physically die if that's what God would call you to, so great would be your love and devotion to him. And he said, you need to be willing to do that daily, he says. And then he says, and follow me. Well, to follow Jesus, you need to know who he is and what he wants us to do, and we find that in the word of God. And so to say it another way, one must be willing to submit and obey the word of God. All of which to say, the true follower of Jesus Christ understands resurrection day. God has given him eyes and ears, a mind and a heart to comprehend spiritual truth. Not everyone can do that. The one who is not a true follower of Jesus Christ does not, cannot understand all that it encompasses. Now, what I want to do this morning is give you a picture of what I've already said from Acts chapter 10. But before we get there, let me tie in what I'm going to say this morning with what we've been learning Sunday mornings from the book of Ephesians. If you're interested, you can find those sermons on our website. As you know, for those of you who've been with us, Paul in chapter 1 tells us that God is to be blessed. He explains why God is to be blessed. He's to be blessed for what he has done for us. He told us that God, in eternity past, designated some to be saved from the penalty of their sin. In time, God provided the means for spiritually dead men to be redeemed through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where he sacrificed himself in death. His sacrificial death satisfied the wrath of God and paid for the sins of those he had chosen. In time then, at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit gave the spiritually dead man the faith to believe. A a dead man can't believe. A dead man can't exercise faith. The Holy Spirit gave the spiritually dead man the ability to believe and permanently indwelt him providing for him the down payment, First uh, Ephesians 1, 
verse chapter talks about, and the guarantee of heaven. You can't lose your salvation. You didn't earn it. You did nothing to gain it. God gave it to you as a gift. Now, these are all among the most obvious blessings true followers of Jesus Christ have and that they've been given by virtue of what God and Christ and the Holy Spirit has done on their behalf. Paul, he defines this as being placed in Christ, into Christ. True followers of Jesus Christ being in Christ. And so our eternal salvation from the penalty of our sin is a result of being chosen by God in eternity past. Everything needed for life and godliness is the result of being chosen by God. The third major aspect of being chosen by God is at the moment of salvation, by virtue of being placed into the body of Christ, we have been placed into this invisible, universal, what we've called capital C, church in Christ. Now, when I say capital C church, and this is important, I am referring to the fact that there are two churches that you need to be aware of. There is the visible church. That's the lower case C church, the visible church. There's, here in Marysville, there's one on every single corner. That's the visible church. The visible church is composed, the Bible says, of sheep and goats. I didn't write the book. That's just what the book says. There are sheep and goats in the visible church. Now, sheep are those who are chosen by God in eternity past, saved in time, and are true followers of Jesus Christ. Goats are those pretenders, posers. They, they have not denied themselves. They look like true followers of Jesus Christ because they show up in the visible church, but they're not true followers of Jesus Christ. They have not denied themselves. <clears throat> they're not willing to die to self or die for Christ. And they do not submit and obey the word of God. So the capital C church speaks of those in the true church the invisible universal church. And you understand this. We all know people who claim to be Christians and live like the devil. But on Sunday, especially on what they would call Easter Sunday, they put the Christian smile on and they come to church and they act as if all the stuff they've done during the week, demonstrating they're not true followers of Christ as if that didn't exist. We all know people like that. So that's the difference in the visible church. God is not mocked in the invisible universal church. It's comprised of only those true followers of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul explains that all men and women born of men and women, are conceived, get this, born and walk in sin. Therefore, all human beings begin life as the enemies of God. They're therefore alienated from God. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die in the place of all who would believe, to save them from the penalty of their sins, <clears throat> make them spiritually alive in Christ and able to conquer sin, Satan, and death by virtue of the fact that Jesus died, was buried as the evidence of his death, and then rose from the dead. That explains <clears throat> why the resurrection is the most important event in the history of the world. If Jesus doesn't rise from the dead, Christmas is wonderful, right? We love Christmas. Baby born in the manger, how great that is. God comes to earth, adds on humanity to deity. What a wonderful story. But if he does not live a sinless, perfect life and die 
and then conquer death, well, then this is all a waste of time, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. If he did not conquer death, then he can't enable us to conquer death either. Jesus explains that in John 14, verse 19. He, uh, verse 14, verse 19, he says, After a little while, the world will no longer see me. The world will no longer see me. Those non-believers, those who are not true followers of Jesus Christ, they, they won't see me anymore because he will have ascended back to heaven following his resurrection. resurrection. But he says, you will see me because I live, you will live also. Speaking of those true followers of Jesus Christ. All those who are true followers of Jesus Christ will see Jesus again because he has saved us from the penalty of our sin, which reconciled us with God so that when we die, we'll wake up in heaven with Jesus, who conquered death so that we could conquer death also. Now, I've given you a lot of theology. And and if you're visiting this morning, you may think, wow, I I went to church, I woke up in a postgraduate seminary class. (laughs) This is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God of God. It's all sufficient and it's all authoritative. It demands that we study it, which demands that we have our heads tuned in. Now again, true followers of Jesus Christ can understand this. It's difficult for those Paul calls who are natural men not spiritually alive. Now, I've given you all this theology, and, and frankly, you may need to be praying that God would help you to understand what I've said, because failure to do so impacts eternity, where we will spend eternity. But as I said, what what I want to do this morning is show you from Acts chapter 10 how how all that I said is demonstrated in the life of two men. One, a man named Cornelius, a Gentile, and the other, an apostle named Simon Peter. Bottom line, Easter can be to you what it is to all true followers of Jesus Christ. You can know the fullness of the resurrection in your life every single day. You can know what it is to be spiritually alive, to be alive to God. But in order to be alive to God, you must pray that God will enable you to hear the message this day. Now, if you're already there, we're in Acts chapter 10. If you're not already there, find it, Acts chapter 10. Now, to understand this book, I have to give you a little background here. The book of Acts is what we call a transitional book. It's not a normal book in the Bible. It's the only historical book in the New Testament. There are things that take place in this book that are not normative for life. The reason for that is that the book, the the, the Bible, the canon of Scripture was not complete when we read the details of Acts. Once the canon of Scripture was complete, that became the guide for life and for all of biblical doctrine. So it's not normative. The book of Acts records the growth of the new church. Jesus has died, he's been buried, he rose from the dead, and he returned to the right hand of Father God in heaven. Having ascended to heaven, he sent his spirit, the Holy Spirit, back in the form to form to form the church, his church, and to live in his church and to indwell his church. And by that I mean the true followers of Jesus Christ who make up that invisible, that universal invisible church. We read about all of that in the second chapter of Acts. The Spirit of God came and the church was born. Then from Acts chapter 10. Through Acts chapter 10, 2 through 10, where, where, where we're going to be this morning, the church has been growing. From Jerusalem, 
where the church began, where people were saved from their sins, that church began, and, and then to Judea, where it spread, and then to the Samaritans, where, who, who were hated because they were half Jewish and half Gentile, and then the last group to be saved and to be placed by God into the church are these Gentiles, and that is what we're going to see in our passage for this morning. And so as we come to the 10th chapter of the book of Acts, Peter is about, Peter, one of the apostles, is about to preach a sermon to a group of Gentiles, which will, which will result in their salvation and their being brought into the church. Now you need to know, and this is key, the message that Peter preaches is always the same message. It's the message the apostles always preached. The message was that Jesus Christ was crucified for the sins of those he enabled to believe. He was buried. He rose from the dead, and he's coming back again. And when he does, he will come to judge those who have rejected him. The message is always the same. It's the same to the Jews. It's the same to the Samaritans. It's the same to the Gentiles. And it's the same to every one of us, especially those who are not true followers of Jesus Christ. The message is the same. This is the only possible way you can be saved from the penalty of your sins. Well, I'm not that bad of a sinner. Well, if you've ever sinned at all, guess what? That keeps you out of heaven. The standard isn't, did you sin just a little bit? That's not the standard. The standard is perfect holiness. You shall be holy, for I, God, am holy. That's the Old Testament standard. That's the New Testament standard. This is the only way for a sinful man to be reconciled with a perfect holy God, and it's through God-enabled faith in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, in terms of the history of the church, the true church, what we have here in Acts is a monumentous event. This is massive. We are watching the final barrier as it falls pushed aside by Jesus Christ to allow the dreaded, hated Gentiles into the church for the very first time. And I'm not sure you can fully understand just how massive this event is because we're so far removed from this today. Now, we are beginning every day, you read about it in the news, we're beginning to see the old hatred of the Jews creep up again. It's right from the pit of hell. The Jews, Israel, are God's chosen people. And he's real clear. God's real clear. Bless Israel, I will bless you. Don't bless Israel, I will curse you. Pretty simple to see how that works out in this world. There were Jews, many of them, the majority of them, because of the way they were raised and what they were taught, who believed with all of their hearts that the Gentiles were actually created by God to be the fuel for the fires of hell. If a Jewish boy married a Gentile girl, a funeral was held. Jews called Gentiles dogs and barbarians. In my ministry at Grace Community Church, one of my responsibilities was to help young couples prepare them for marriage. One of my young couples was a Jewish boy engaged to a Gentile girl. And the day he got engaged, he came home to his family to discover that every single object that he owned was on their front lawn. Just as a good Jewish mother would do, she at least piled it neatly in little stacks for him. And that's a picture. That's a picture. In return, the Gentiles looked at the Jews as slave material 
and commonly called them the enemies of the human race. And so in response to this, the Holy Spirit has to move in and shatter these attitudes before he could weld together the church into one body, Jew and Gentile. Look at verse 1. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now, there was a man... A, uh, there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a, century, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. He was a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. What we have here is a prominent Gentile soldier named Cornelius. He believed in God, but as I explained it to you, he was not a true follower of Jesus Christ. Had he died, catch this, before the end of this chapter, he would have spent eternity in hell. Oh, he believed in God? He paid tithes to the Jews, prayed all the time. He was not a true follower of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. I've seen that. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tenor named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants, notice he obeys, and a devout soldier of, of those who were his personal attendants. After he explained everything, he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So, get this. God enables Cornelius through some miraculous events involving angels to send some men to find Simon Peter, the apostle. Now remember, I told you this is a transitional book. It is not normative. If you have an angel visit you, go see a doctor. <laughs> That's not normative. This is not the way God deals with people today. Today, God speaks to true followers of Jesus Christ through the prompting of the indwelling Holy Spirit, through the word of God. So meanwhile, God speaks to Peter, telling him that things are about to change. Look at verse 9. On the next day, as they were on their way, approaching the city, Peter went up on the house top about the sixth hour to preach or to pray. And he became hungry and was desiring to eat, but while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance, not normative, and he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheep coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, by no means, Lord. P Peter had a tendency to do that, tell God no, that's Peter, by no means, Lord, no, for I've never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times. And immediately the object was taken up in the sky. In other words, as Peter would learn later, the old restrictions of Jewish law had been done away when Jesus died to become the final perfect sacrifice for sins, and he conquered death when he rose from the grave. God says, that's old news, Peter. That's old news. Verse 17, now while Peter was greatly perplexed, you can't believe how perplexed he was in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be. Behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, also called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, that's the Holy Spirit, behold, three men are looking for you. 
You see how God's, God's working all this together. He's moving all these details together. Get up, go downstairs, accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I'm the one you're looking for. What's the reason for which you have come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, he's not a true follower of Jesus Christ. This is a religious guy. He's really religious. Was divinely directed by the holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and gave them lodging. And on the next day he got up and went away with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied them. On the following day, he entered Caesarea. Now, Cornelius was waiting for them, listen to this, and had called together his relatives and close friends. He has to have a crowd. Because, see, if he gets saved by himself, no one's going to believe this. So he has to have a crowd. God prompts his heart, tell all your relatives about this. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up, I to am just a man. In, in other words, there's two important details you can't miss here. By gathering a group of, a group of Gentiles together to listen to Peter, many Gentiles would be enabled by God to hear this life-saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice also, that Cornelius, by worshiping Peter, that tells us that he did not yet understand that God alone was worthy of worship. Verse 27. As he talked with them, he entered and found many people assembled. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who was a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for. He obeyed God. So I ask, for what reason you have sent for me? And Cornelius said, four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in shining garments, not normative. And he said, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Therefore, send to Joppa, invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He's staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present, and what we know by reading the text is prepared by God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. <clears throat> God has prepared the heart of these spiritually dead Gentiles, the family, the friends who believed in God, but rejected Jesus Christ, and he prepared the heart of this legalistic Jewish apostle to understand that Jesus died to pay the penalty for the sins of both Jew and Gentile, and all that stuff in the law had been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. What I want you to see here is that God had prepared the hearts of these Gentiles to respond to the message that they would hear. And God enabled Peter to understand that he, he died, Christ died to provide the payment for Jew and Gentile alike, that he would enable to believe. Now watch what happens, verse 34. And, and what we're going to see here is that Peter is led by the Holy Spirit to give a simple gospel presentation to these spiritually dead people. Now, this is very different from of the, some of the other detailed, more detailed presentations of the gospel that we find in the early chapters of the book of Acts, and that's a good reminder for us. There are some situations that might call for a detailed, apologetic, and historic presentation of the gospel message. Others 
with divinely prepared hearts require only the simple truth of the gospel. Cornelius and the other Gentiles gathered with him were such divinely prepared individuals. That's what we've just read about. Clear from the text. Verse 34, opening his mouth. Stop right there. That phrase is a standard Greek expression telling us that the words to follow are really, really important. Verse 34, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. Now, don't miss this. Peter begins his sermon by saying that it doesn't matter whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, a wretched sinner, or someone who has tried to live a moral life. Jesus Christ died for the sins of every man enabled to believe in him. And because all men are born spiritually dead, God must enable all men to believe. But the point is, no man is beyond God's ability to save from the penalty of their sin. Now remember, the Jews were so self-righteous that it was beyond their belief that God could ever save any Gentile. But God has made it clear to Peter in that vision up on the roof that that's not the case. Now, what's sad here is that none of this should have been a surprise to Peter if he had remembered and believed what God said in the Old Testament. It's clear there that God is not a God of partiality. Listen to this, Deuteronomy 10, verse 17. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality. Well, I, I, you know, I just don't think God could save me because I've done such bad things. Well, that would make you higher than God. That would make God a liar. And that would mean that God does show partiality. Oh, it's clear he doesn't. Uh, 2 Chronicles 19.7. Now then, then let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be very careful what you do, for the Lord our God will have no part in unrighteousness or partiality. Job 34, 19, God shows no partiality to princes, no regards the rich, nor does he regard the rich above the poor, for they are all the work of his hands. In other words, God is able to save anyone. Peter expands on this, verse 35. But in every nation, he doesn't show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Now, some have misunderstood this verse to be teaching universalism, that God accepts all who are sincere about God and on the basis of their good works believe God and that he'll take them to heaven when they die. But that obviously contradicts the entire passage that we're looking at, it, in, it, it contradicts clear biblical teaching. If, if Cornelius and the others were already saved because they were serious about knowing God, then what Peter is doing here, preaching that only through the name of Jesus can souls be saved, it would have been a waste of time. We wouldn't have the chapter in the Bible. Look at verse 43 for a second. Of him, God, Christ, All the prophets bear witness that through his name, the name of Jesus Christ, everyone who believes in him dies to self to live for Jesus, receives forgiveness for sins. That ties it all together. Further, that they were not yet saved from the penalty of their sins is clearly stated in Acts chapter 11, verse 14. Look there for a second. Acts chapter 11, by verse... 14, he will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household who believes with you. 
So is salvation by works? Is there something a dead person could do to be right with God? Answer is no, of course not. Peter is simply expressing here the reality of the Holy Spirit at work in the heart of the sinner. Look at John chapter 16 for a moment. I'll read it to you. John 16, this is Jesus explaining the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the spiritually dead man to prepare his heart to receive the good news of the gospel. This is an explanation of what we've just been looking at in Acts chapter 10. Here from John 16, verse 8, and he, when he comes, that's the Holy Spirit, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Oh, they believe in God. No, they don't believe in Christ. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and no longer, you no longer see me. And, and, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has already been judged. That's Satan. Notice, back to Acts 10, notice what the work the Holy Spirit in the unbeliever's life produces. Check this out. Verse 34, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. Verse 35, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. In other words, the convicting work of the Holy Spirit produces a person who fears or reverences God and does what is right and is welcome, interesting word, dektos in the Greek, it means marked by a favorable manifestation of divine pleasure. We find the same word in 2 Corinthians 6 too. At the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time, there's that word, behold, now is the day of salvation. In other words... It is the convicting work of the Holy Spirit that enables a spiritually dead person to be welcome or acceptable to the time of salvation. That's what the Holy Spirit did in the life of Cornelius and those other Gentiles. Oh, they already believed about God. You, you do understand <clears throat> that everyone in hell believes about God. Oh, I guess he was right. They believe about God. Jesus Christ is the issue. No matter what the age, race, sex, social status, strata, Jew or Gentile, when the Holy Spirit convicts the heart of the spiritually dead man, his heart will begin to hunger for God and for righteousness, making it ready for salvation. They're not saved from the penalty of their sins yet. But the Spirit of God is drawing them to God. And see, what we have here is Cornelius responding to the work of God in his heart, and yet don't think for a moment he's doing any of this in his own strength. It's the grace of God drawing him. No Jew or Gentile or anyone is able to come to God on his own. And why? Because they're all spiritually dead. Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul makes this very clear for us. Romans 3, listen to this. Are we better than they? 3 verse 9, not at all. We've already charged that both Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. For it is written, there is none righteous. Who's that talking about? Everyone. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. Well, I, I think I understand. I believe in God. I, I, you know, I try to, I try to live a, a righteous life. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have all become useless. There is none who does good, spiritually good. There is not even one. He said that three times now. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace, they've not known that. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Well, wait, I believe God. No, there's no fear of God. 
before your eyes. That's a description of the spiritually dead. Now go back to Acts 10 again. God had worked in Cornelius' heart so that he wants to know and obey God. When he heard the saving truth of the gospel, God enables him to respond. Peter has introduced his sermon by assuring them that salvation is available to those whose, God, who, who, whose hearts have been prepared by God. Yet it was not enough for them to merely know of its availability. They, they needed to know how appropriate, how to appropriate the forgiveness of sin and deliverance from judgment. And so Peter then turns to the main theme of the gospel. In other words, that salvation comes through Jesus Christ to anyone from any nation. Look at verse 36. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. What's this? Well, the gospel of Jesus Christ went first to the Jews. They were first to understand that God could save them from the penalty of their sins. Paul says this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Now notice, if you will, that Peter refers to the gospel as the glorious message of peace through Jesus Christ. As I told you, every single person ever born is born as a sinner, spiritually dead, therefore enemies at war with God. Oh, it doesn't feel like it. Well, you are. And it was only the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ that provided the possibility for spiritually dead man, the enemy of God, to be reconciled with a perfect holy God. And only the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in paying for the sins of all who would believe made it possible for peace. For peace between man and God and between man and man. God was reconciling us while we were dead, Scripture says. Now, notice that little parenthetical thought, end of verse 36. Do you see it? He is Lord of all. Peter's point is that salvation is offered to all because of the fact that Jesus is Lord of all. He's the master of everything that exists. Well, he then moves to remind these Gentiles of some very important hallmarks of Christ's ministry. Look at verse 37. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. Now, John the Baptist's, John the Baptizer's baptism was a baptism that demonstrated an attitude of repentance for sins. It was a baptism that demonstrated a longing for the reign of Messiah. It prepared the nation of Israel for the promised Messiah, who, who was Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 38, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God appointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. You'll remember that when Jesus Christ began his earthly ministry, God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. God speaking to him from heaven said, Matthew 3, 17, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Peter describes Christ's ministry as doing good and then lists as an example his healing ministry of all who were oppressed by the devil that phrase is interesting in that it encompasses the whole gamut of human ailments. What he's saying is God dealt with people's sin and he dealt with their sickness. He dealt with their sickness as an, author as an authenticating sign or miracle that he was in fact God. No one else could do what he did and no one else denied what he did. Then Peter says, yeah, everything you heard about Jesus is true. Look at verse 39. We are witnesses 
We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also, they also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. He says, we're witnesses. He's speaking of the apostles. Secondly, everyone who witnessed the authenticating miracles of God, telling the world that Jesus was God in the flesh. And then he says, they, they, those were the religious leaders of Israel, the most religious people in the world. The religious leaders of Israel who, who had God incarnate crucified. The religious men would lead an effort to put to death the one who went around doing good and overruling the work of Satan. That tells you that hell will be populated mostly by religious people, people who believed they were serving God when in fact they were spiritually dead and only serving Satan. And yet God's overcome all of that. Look at, God raised him up, Jesus. God raised Jesus up on the third day and granted that he become visible. Oh, he wanted people to see this. Not to all people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us. Who's he talking about? True followers of Jesus Christ, who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. Peter says Jesus became visible after his resurrection so that he could not be overlooked or dismissed. It's, it's hard to dismiss a person who was dead and is now alive. What are you going to do with that? Countless heretics from apostolic times right up to the present have denied the truth of Christ's physical resurrection. And they do that because that one act is absolutely central to biblical Christianity. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached and he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? If there's no resurrection from the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith is also in vain. Moreover, we're even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. He says the same thing over and over. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless. You're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, that means died, they've perished. It's over for them. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, if he does not raise us from the dead, we are of all men most to be pitied. Those who deny Christ's literal resurrection destroy the only bridge spanning the gulf separating the spiritually dead from God. And just for the record, Paul has left us the, the, the inspired fact that the risen Jesus appeared to several others as well. Listen to this. First, first Corinthians 15, verse 5. He was buried, he was raised on the third day, verse 4, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, and after that, he appeared to more than five, more, more than five hundred more than five hundred brethren at one time, most of whom remain until the time this book was written. Some have died, he says. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, to one as untimely born, he appeared to me. Paul is speaking. Listen to this. It takes only two or three witnesses in a court of law to have a valid testimony. Jesus was seen by more than 500 people. Now, not everyone had the privilege of witnessing the resurrected Christ. Back to Acts 10. Not all people... Jesus didn't do another tour of Italy, another tour of Israel. But he did reveal himself to those who would bear witness to the world that Jesus Christ had truly risen from the dead. And they were all true followers of Jesus Christ. 
Uh, don't miss the fact when he, he, he says that Jesus ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead, that serves to, to offer proof that Jesus rose from the dead bodily. In traditional Jewish thought, spirit beings were incapable of eating or drinking. A lot of people said, well, it was just his, his spirit floating around. That's what you saw. No, he's eating and he's drinking. Well, that blessing results in responsibility, verse 42. And he ordered, Christ ordered us, it's a military term, to preach to the people and to solemnly testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Literally, he says, we were commanded to preach that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah who will be to every person either their deliverer from the penalty of sin or their judge. Notice the apostles weren't the only ones Witnesses of Jesus Christ, of him, verse 43, all the prophets bear witness through his name, that through his name. Uh, prophets bearing witness, that's Old Testament. That, that's, that's Old Testament. Isaiah 53, 11, Jeremiah 31, 34, Zechariah 13, verse 1, those were among the Old Testament prophets who spoke of the forgiveness of sins that Messiah, Jesus Christ, would bring. And the obvious point is that all that Jesus is and did is the culmination of divine promises made centuries earlier in the Old Testament. Now, don't miss the last sentence of his sermon here. Of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, that's the name of Jesus, speaking of everything that he is, Everyone, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. Every component of the gospel message is critical. Everyone indicates the universal offer of saving grace. In other words, salvation is possible for Jew and Gentile, moral person and lifelong sinner. Then the phrase, who believes in him, indicates the means of receiving saving grace by faith in Christ alone. It is literally God-enabled faith, God-enabled faith in the spiritually dead man to believe in Jesus Christ because no spiritually dead man can exercise faith. And then the phrase receives forgiveness of sins indicates the marvelous unspeakable privilege conferred by the saving grace of God. In him we have redemption through his blood. He's paid for our sin by his death, the forgiveness of our sins. Now, let me tie all this together for you. We've talked about the fact that if God has not opened your eyes, ears, heart, and mind to comprehend and appropriate spiritual truth, you will not and you cannot understand what I've said this day. Everything from understanding that Easter is really Resurrection Day to the only way for a sinner to be saved and reconciled with God, you can't understand that. You gloss over that. We've talked about the fact that all men are born spiritually dead as the enemies of God and therefore unable to be reconciled with the perfect holy God. What, what could a dead person do to make himself right? Answer, nothing. We've talked about the fact that true followers of Jesus Christ are those who have been enabled to deny self, be willing to die for Christ, and submit and obey the word of God. We've talked about the fact that Jesus Christ, God incarnate, lived a perfect sinless life, went to the cross to pay the price demanded by God for the sins of all who would believe. We've talked about the fact, and I've given you an example of how God, through the Holy Spirit, prepares a heart to receive the truth. 
We've talked about the, the offer of salvation, that it's offered to all men regardless of who they are or what they've done. We've talked about the fact that a lot of the people who believe that they're headed for heaven are in for the final shock of their life when God tells them he doesn't even know who they are. Oh, but I believed in God. Man, I listened to that long sermon on that Easter Sunday. And we've talked about the fact that to reject the truth of the word of God will send you to hell should you die rejecting the truth that I've given you this day. You should know by now what we mean when we talk about resurrection day. I, I, I really, frankly, don't have the words to help you understand the peace that comes from knowing that if I die right here, standing here of a massive heart attack, I will wake up in the presence of Jesus Christ. The Bible describes that as peace that goes beyond understanding, comprehension. You too can have that peace, but you must be a true follower of Jesus Christ. You say, okay, I follow what do I need to do that? Well, first of all, you need to pray that God would open your eyes and ears and heart and mind to comprehend this truth. You need to acknowledge that your religious efforts are useless. There's nothing that you can do to be accepted by a holy God. You need to acknowledge that you're a sinner, an enemy of God, and that you're destined and deserving of the wrath of God. You're deserving of an eternity in hell because your sin, no matter how small, no matter how minor, it has violated the perfect holy standard of God. You need to ask God to help you believe that Jesus as God, fully God, fully man, died in your place to pay the penalty for your sins and that he rose from the dead, conquering sin, Satan, and death so that you might be able to do the same. And then you need to tell someone that God has called you to himself. And then you need to join a church that teaches you, verse by verse, the word of God. Because it's through the word of God that you will grow in your relationship with Christ. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. I know we have covered a lot of material. I also know that for those who you have graciously made spiritually alive, they understand, they get it, they rejoice in what's been shared this day. I also know that there are some who, at this point, just want to get out of here. I get that. That's how I was for the first couple decades of my life. I sat under the teaching of the Word of God every single Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I knew it. I understood it. I did not appropriate it. But I also knew that should I die, I would have spent eternity in hell because I was rejecting the truth. And I know today, Father, you have graciously brought to this place people who are now more accountable for the truth because I've explained it as clearly as I can. And that short of them praying that you would help them to get it, they're not going to get it. I would pray, Father, that at some point you would remind them of truth, bring it to their memory, convict them through the Holy Spirit that they need a Savior. There is no other way to escape hell than through Jesus Christ. Help them to understand hell will be absolutely inundated with religious people who knew all the details and rejected the reality of it. 
We're so grateful that that tomb is empty. We've experienced that in our life, and we praise you for that. We'll praise you for that all of eternity. Thank you for our time together this day. All these things, Lord, we pray in your name. Amen.